Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Protecting Healthcare in Conflict Areas, Lessons from Ukraine to Tigray, focused around the impact armed conflict has on global health. My name is Lindsay Martin, and I'm a critical care nurse practitioner and the director of the Global Disaster Response and Humanitarian Action Program at Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Global Health. The MGH Center for Global Health has partnered with the Harvard Global Health Institute, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and the Belfair Center for Science and International Affairs on this webinar to address the escalating attacks on healthcare infrastructure, personnel, and patients in instances of armed conflict. Our speakers will also reflect on the challenges in preventing, documenting, and prosecuting such attacks. At this moment, it is imperative that we address these attacks, both in places where they are captured by cameras and critically where they are not captured. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes. This session is being streamed and recorded through Zoom, and the recording will be made available on the HGHI website afterwards. We will be running a live Q&A towards the end of the panel discussion, so we have enabled our ask a question feature on the bottom of your screen. Please put all questions here throughout the event, and we will do our best to answer them during the Q&A portion. We have also enabled the chat function, which will be monitored by our colleague Car uh, Carissa. Please make sure that you set message recipient as everyone when using the chat. To get started, we would love to hear from everyone what city or country you're currently in. I'm currently in Cambridge, Massachusetts. With that, I have the honor of introducing you to our keynote speaker today. Dr. Africa Stewart is the president of MSF USA. She graduated with honors from Johns Hopkins University in 1995 with a BA in psychology and mathematics science. She then attended Drexel University Medical School in Philadelphia in 1999. She completed a master's of business administration with a concentration in strategic planning from the University of Pittsburgh Cat School of Business. When she returned to Philadelphia to finish her medical training at Drexel. In 2000, she received a doctorate in medicine and began obstetrics and gynecology residency at Hanuman University Hospital. Her career with MSF began in Sudan in June 2011. Dr. Stewart has completed five surgical field missions, served as a guide for the Forest from Home exhibit in 2016, and joined the board of directors in 2017. She continues to support women's health care locally and abroad with an emphasis on education and prevention. Dr. Stewart, please take it away. That was good, thank you. Um, it always seems like a lot when I hear my bio, but the truth is uh, I'm a wife and a mom and an OBGYN. I'm an advocate for women's health, and I am currently serving as president and chair of the board of directors for Doctors Without Borders. Uh, Doctors Without Borders was founded by French doctors and journalists. So in French, we are called Médecins Sans Fortier, which I love the sound of it. And we typically uh, refer to ourselves as MSF. Um, with that, I will stop with the alphabet soup and just take a moment to say it's my honor to be here. Thank you for the invite. Uh, where to begin? Our work is 50 years old. Uh, we have seen blatant attacks on healthcare facilities and staff throughout this 50 years of work. These types of attacks are not new, but each one is newly shocking. Wars have rules, and that includes not targeting civilians and not targeting hospitals. This idea of protected people and places has been thoroughly examined over the years and culminated in the Geneva Conventions, which lay out the rules of warfare, including what we now refer to as international humanitarian law. And yet day by day, we see attacks in places like Afghanistan and Ethiopia to my east and Ukraine. I am currently sitting in our office in Nairobi, Kenya as a guest of my colleagues here. So Forgive the echo a bit, but I, this is the only quiet place I could find. Um, as it relates to international law, I'll say that I am I'm not an expert on any, any law. My expertise is big bellies and babies and moms. But when conflicts enter hospitals, when conflicts turn our patients into targets, it becomes my concern. 
And it should also be the concern of governments across the world who are supposed to protect civilians and humanitarian medical staff and their structures. A hospital is a place where people go because they need care and where they should without question be safe. Attacking a hospital is in some ways a double attack because it attacks the people themselves, my colleagues and patients that are in that building, but it also makes it impossible for them to seek care for their injuries. It can also deprive an entire community of health services, often in places where those services were already scarce or difficult to reach. Two years ago, on May 12th of 2020, just two days after Mother's Day in the US, one of the most horrific attacks on a hospital took place in Afghanistan. This attack was targeted at the Darsh Dabarshi Hospital in Kabul, Afghanistan, where armed gunmen invaded the maternity ward and systematically killed pregnant patients, women with newborns in their arms, In total, 24 people, including a MSF midwife named Mary Ann, 16 mothers, two children aged seven and eight were killed. Six of MSF staff, one newborn and a caretaker were among those injured. And I use the term newborn in its truest sense, newly born, just after APGAR scores were taken. But in spite of that sudden nature, uh, 90 people were able to take shelter in the hospital's safe room. Yes, we have safe rooms in our hospitals. We shouldn't need them. And they should never be needed. But this security feature saved many lives that day. We know this because not one of the people outside of the safe room was spared in this attack. As an obstetrician and a mom, as a human being that lives in this world, the idea that an attack will specifically target women in the act of giving birth is beyond my comprehension. I spent years of my training trying to support women's health learning to identify and manage those pregnancy risks early, helping to bring these new lives into the world safely. And nothing in my training prepared me for this, this idea that people would intend to kill my patients. The harm that was caused by this attack had far reaching effects. In total, 24 lives were lost those who were injured faced painful recoveries, and in some cases, lifelong medical consequences. The psychological wounds inflicted on those survivors, on those bereaved families, may last just as long. And beyond the walls of the hospital that day, others suffered, they continued to suffer from losing an important source of safe, local and dignified health care. In June, on June 15th of that year, MSF made that heartbreaking decision to withdraw from the hospital. We knew that stopping our work meant leaving huge gaps in access to care for infants and pregnant patients. In the year prior, 16,000 deliveries were assisted by MSF in that hospital. But without an understanding of what motivated such an attack, without any accountability for guilty parties, and without the ability to gain assurances that it wouldn't happen again, we could not and we would not continue to work there. Another attack on healthcare workers took place just over a year ago when our colleagues at MSF, Maria, Tedros, and Johannes were killed in Ethiopia. Again, we know that their murders were intentional. And until now, no one has been held accountable. As conflict continues in Ethiopia, those who suffer most are the civilians who cannot access urgent medical care. 
The deaths of our colleagues were in truth, just three of many aid workers killed in Tigray since the start of the conflict. MSF, we mourn all of their deaths. As well, we mourn the inability to provide meaningful aid in the midst of an ongoing conflict in that region. Those losses were fresh in our minds as we started to think of our colleagues working in Ukraine. Since 2014, MSF has supported conflict-affected areas in Ukraine. Medical care to people who are otherwise forced to cross dangerous areas in order to receive care and access medications. With this extreme escalation and violence in February of this year, MSF accordingly scaled up our response. Millions of people have been internally displaced. Millions of others are forced into neighboring countries. Civilians have been injured, killed, homes and cities destroyed, and healthcare sites have been damaged beyond repair. The World Health Organization has recorded 323 attacks on healthcare facilities and healthcare personnel, resulting in 76 deaths. There is no doubt that medical care is needed in Ukraine, but providing this care and providing logistical support to Ukrainian hospitals and clinics is not without risk. We assess, we reassess these risks, we take precautions, ensure our staff are prepared and equipped but the reality is that our staff are also civilians. They require the respect and the protection from warring parties. When people ask me about my work and where I've worked, a common question is, how do you keep your staff safe? And that question as a leader sits heavy on my heart and on my mind at all times. When humanitarian aid workers sign up to go to war zones, we know that there are risks associated with our work. We don't go into war zones with weapons and body armor. Our tools, our medicine, our armor is the logo that symbolizes our status as protected under international law by our function and our conduct. Our protection is not from armed guards, but our principles. Neutrality is my protection. Impartiality is my protection. Independence is my protection. That's how we keep our colleagues safe. Through our actions, we make it clear that we might be present in a war, but we are not part of the conflict. Understanding and respecting this protection of healthcare workers is in everyone's best interest. While most people are not thinking in terms of international law, they are acutely aware that in a conflict, they or someone they love might just need a doctor. I accepted my first mission with MSF when my youngest was just a few months shy of her second birthday. I accepted this assignment because I could hear the desperation in the staff that called me. I could hear that there was no one else, that I was a few weeks away from orientation. I hadn't signed up or done anything. My children were little but I could hear it in her voice. I could hear that there wasn't anybody else. So I went because conflict amplifies the need for healthcare, but it does not change the baseline healthcare needs of a population. Even in conflict, people become pregnant and complications arise. Even in conflict, babies are born and children become sick. Even in conflict, kids need routine childhood vaccines. Humanitarians seek to create a normalcy, a sense of solidarity with people who are in a context that is anything but normal. We assume risks not because we are reckless, but because we can save lives. The thing that I'm good at is the thing that this community needs, and that's why we go. We conduct risk assessments. We negotiate with leaders of armed forces to ensure access to patients in need. We ask for guarantees of protection from all parties to a conflict and we regularly remind them of their promises and their obligations. But the reality is not all parties to a conflict will care about the rules of war 
no care about legal protections the healthcare workers have. Not all persons with the power to inflict harm will do so according to the rules set forth by the Geneva Conventions. There are people and groups beyond the reach of humanitarian negotiations who don't respect the rules or the law. And these are the most difficult risks to measure. These are the most difficult to assess, whether you're a healthcare worker at an abortion clinic in the US, a midwife in Afghanistan, or a surgeon in Syria. I have twice been held at gunpoint on my way to an MSF hospital. And the only thing that saved me is my role, my uniform. I'm the one that helps the moms. I'm the one who delivers the babies. And as a doctor, I have to provide my patients with accurate information, local, appropriate to the context. And obtaining informed consent is essential to what I do. No matter where you practice medicine, that piece of what we do is standard. And increasingly, I'm hearing MSF staff asking for informed consent, to asking about the risk that they assume when they are working in conflict settings. The brutal killings of humanitarian aid workers and attacks on healthcare facilities create their own chilling effect on dedicated staff who have to balance their duty to their families with their desire to care for their patients. In all the countries where MSF works, whether that's Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, healthcare workers such as myself step up to care for people who are caught in these conflicts. We care for anyone and everyone in need, no matter who they are. It does not matter to us what language a person speaks, what God they worship, what uniform they wear. We assess wounds and medical conditions and prioritize according to the need and humanitarian principles. Our sole objective is to save lives and reduce suffering. We do not seek to influence political outcomes or align ourselves with any actions beyond those that are life-saving. We know that not all groups will understand this, but we know that governments are very much capable of understanding these principles. And we call on them today and every day to protect humanitarian medical space through their laws, through their words, and through their actions. So I will conclude in the simplest phrase that, that has come across me in these years. And it was my youngest daughter explaining to someone else my work. She puts it so simply, but it is always true. My mommy helps mommies that live far away. And in that way, if we can remind ourselves that what we do at its simplest is what a community needs, what they ask for in times that we could never imagine. And with that, I will close and hope to have the conversation that moves us forward. The conversation that instills within all of us the opportunity to do what we can, do the thing that you're good at, but know that the conflicts and the changes that we're seeing in this world may not stop. And that may amplify the need of our patients across the world. But that's the work. I'm a mommy who helps mommies who live far away. Thank you. Lindsay, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Africa Stewart, for your reflections and giving us context and, and most of all, I think, directing our focus to the most vulnerable, uh, particularly uh, women and children. I think your remarks give us insight into the risks that we take as healthcare workers in conflict and also the extent of what we lose when healthcare is targeted. And, uh, in your words, thank you for stepping up and your dedication to humanitarian principles. We will now move into our moderated panel discussion. Again, please post your questions in the Q&A during the panel and we will devote the last segment to answering them. Allow me to introduce our excellent panel of speakers. First, uh, 
Leonard Rubinstein is a lawyer who spent his career in human rights and now focuses on health and human rights, especially the protection of health in armed conflict and the roles of health professionals in human rights. At Johns Hopkins, he is core faculty at the Center for Public Health and Human Rights and the, Bern the Berman Institute of Bioethics. He previously served as executive director and then president of Physicians for Human Rights as a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace and as executive director of the Bazelon Center for Mental Health. Professor Rubenstein's current work includes advancing protection of health facilities, patients, and health workers in situations of conflict, advancing refugee and migrant health and rights, and exploring the ethical responsibilities of health professionals to advance human rights. He is the author of Perilous Medicine, The Struggle to Protect Healthcare from the Violence of War. Christina Villa is the founder of the Aid and Danger Project and the Security in Numbers database. Christina's work focuses on monitoring threats and violence affecting aid work with a particular focus on the complex intersection between aid access and the protection of healthcare and education in conflict. Christina edits the annual Safeguarding Health in Conflict Coalition Report for which Insecurity Insight generates the data. Dr. Sheikh Omar Keita is the Emergency Response Team Health Coordinator at the International Rescue Committee. Dr. Keita is a physician, humanitarian, and international athlete from Mali. He grew up in a modest family with a hardworking mother and father and studied medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, Pharmacy, and Odonto Stomatology of Bamako, where he defended his doctoral thesis in general surgery. After his doctorate in general medicine, he completed his master's degree in public health with a concentration in global health. He began his humanitarian work in 2012 as a medical doctor at the International Rescue Committee in Mali, based in uh, Kati's Hospital. From 2015 to 2020, he worked in health and nutrition emergency programs in Mali, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Central African Republic, among others. He hopes to establish a local maternal and child health-centered NGO in his home country of Mali. And finally, our moderator, Dr. Margaret Bordeaux, is the research director of the program in global public policy and social change at Harvard Medical School and the Security and Global Health Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She is an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, an associate physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a faculty fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. Her policy research and service focus on issues at the intersection of health and security. She has worked extensively with the US Department of Defense and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, developing strategies to protect, recover, and reconstruct health systems disrupted by crisis and armed conflict. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much and such a pleasure to, to moderate today. Um, I think the, the way we'll move forward here is to uh, turn it over to our panelists uh, one by one to give us a little context about their work and, and what they're seeing uh, with respect to, to this issue. Um, Professor Rubenstein, I'm gonna have you go first to kind of set, set the stage for us um, and, uh, and tell us about how, how you're thinking about uh, this issue of attacks on healthcare. Uh, thanks so much, Margaret, and uh, thanks uh, to the Harvard Global Health Institute uh, for sponsoring this important discussion. Uh, it's an issue that needs, needs a lot more attention than it is getting. And it's also a real privilege to follow the, uh, the eloquent and sensitive words uh, of Africa's steward expressed in such meaningful personal terms. I'd like to just frame the issue globally quickly uh, in three brief points. One is that there's a lot of talk about these attacks have become the new normal, that something has changed. That change might be the predominance of urban warfare or asymmetrical warfare. Uh, there are many claims about the changes, but in fact, there's been unfortunate continuity of these attacks going back to the 19th century to the first and second world wars, Korea, Vietnam, wars in Central America, the Balkans, Chechnya, 
and more recent wars. And we know, of course, that Russia is a frequent perpetrator, not only in Ukraine and Syria, but going back to the wars in Chechnya. So this is not new. And that makes us have to think about why these attacks occur. In some ways, they're based on dehumanizing enemies. It's part of cruelty of war itself. But I think to really understand what's going on, why they're so frequent, uh, we have to dig a little deeper, especially since the Geneva Conventions, which originated in the protection of healthcare and nothing else, back in 1864, the oldest international treaty concerning anything about human rights or protection of non-combatants. How, after all these years, uh, are these provisions, which are so clear and explicit, uh, violated? And I think, as I try to explain in my book, there's actually a competing set of norms that are rarely articulated, but influences conduct. And they date back to the same period. The argument that moral standards apply in war, but there can be exceptions to win a just war quickly. That's often referred to as military necessity. And that has justified all kinds of reasons for attacking healthcare, sometimes for strategic reasons, sometimes for tactical reasons, sometimes because it's inconvenient to comply with the rules, and sometimes because it's believed that enemies should not be treated for fear that they might come back into the fight. All those reasons are violations of the Geneva Conventions because military necessity, except in the most, most limited circumstances, have been excluded from considerations of the law. But those kinds of reasons and rationalizations for attacks seem to predominate. So then what can be done? It seems to me that many strategies have been tried, but two are really critical. The first is that civilian and military leadership have basically abdicated their responsibility to make sure their troops obey the law. That means having clear rules, not just a rule that says don't attack a hospital or don't attack a wounded combatant. It means training in very specific actions in military operations, at checkpoints, uh, in targeting, in hospital searches, in medical care for enemies. But very few militaries do this, including the militaries that express most commitments to the Geneva Conventions. And we see this too in the influence of the competing norm of military necessity in contemporary law, where counterterrorism law has deemed people affiliated with terrorist organizations unworthy of care. That, that is directly contrary to the Geneva Conventions law and norm and values, but has seeped into the uh, into military practice around the world, especially in the last two decades. So we have to have leadership to restore commitments and operationalize those commitments to the Geneva, Geneva Conventions, which have such broad support around the world. The second thing we're missing is accountability. There's been almost no accountability anywhere for these crimes. There have been very few, just a, one or two prosecutions for war crimes involving healthcare in the last 50 years. But it's also other means of accountability, diplomatic pressures, refusal of arms sales to perpetrators, use of UN mechanisms to hold uh, perpetrators to account that have either been weak or ignored. And so we know these two actions can make a huge difference. And I think it's up to us to make the demand that these be undertaken so that these horrors that, that Africa described can come to an end. 
Uh, and I'll turn it back to, to Margaret now. Thank you so much, um, Professor Rubenstein. I, you know, I think that really sets the stage for us, uh, you know, quite a bit here. You know, thinking about those two different approaches, you know, born really of two different sets of just reasons why these attacks might happen. One is, you know, military expediency on the ground and a decision made by, um, you know, a, a party to the conflict, a lower ranking a member of the party to the conflict. And the second as a uh, reason is really a strategic uh, commitment by one party to the conflict to, you know, actually, you know, target specifically for strategic reasons, um, health centers. Um, and so those two sort of sets of, of, of potential, you know, both both reasons for uh, these attacks and also potential uh, remedies or, or responses to this, I think are, you know, incredibly helpful to, to lay out for us. Um, and I think it, uh, it fits nicely with uh, where Director uh, Villa will take us here in thinking about how to, um, you know, document, uh, collect evidence uh, so that accountability um, you know, might be, uh, might be possible. Um, so uh, Director uh, Villa, can you uh, lay it, uh, take us a little further? Thank you, Dr. Bordeaux. And thank you so much for, to the organizers for putting on this really important event. I'd really like to echo Len's words on this, that this is a subject that requires more attention. We've heard the really compelling testimony of horror from Dr. Africa Stewart of what it means for health workers to work in this context. And as Len said, this is not a new phenomenon. The question I sort of like to bring to the table here for, for discussion and consideration is how do we actually know the scale of the problem? And how can we understand what happens where and why? And how can we use this information to develop prevention and mitigation and also so importantly, the accountability that's needed. Now the healthcare, um, the Safeguarding Health in Conflict Coalition recorded over 1,300 events of attacks on healthcare in 2021, but we know this is not the full scale of the problem. I could talk about this subject for a whole day, but I like to limit myself here to a few points. And um, first of all, I wanted to make a few observations of how the landscape of bringing together this body of evidence has so remarkably changed over the past few years. When I started out with this work in 2008, a few big horrific incidents were reported in global international newspapers. And we could go to affected countries and buy actual paper copies and read them from A to Z to find out what may have been reported locally. Today, local newspapers, radio stations and their transcripts have moved online. Citizen journalists, individual health workers have taken to social media and they're telling their stories. We're having so much more information available now. At the same time, so many organizations from MSF to many other healthcare providers have started to introduce internal reporting mechanisms that they monitor what goes on. So the issue we are facing today in trying to understand where and how this all happens is bringing together this information. Technology can help us a lot in this. But there are also new challenges that come with this new world of so much information online. First of all, we're increasingly also finding fake stories. And so my team who look at these reports have to develop and have constantly have to get better at their online investigative skills to make sure they're not inadvertently reporting things that didn't quite happen or didn't happen in the way as they're being reported. And our dependence on the internet means that those who don't want us to know about it have a very simple means. They can simply block out the internet. And we've seen this happening in Tigray, and we've seen the internet service in the Donbas and other areas of occupied Ukraine being diverted through service in Moscow. When this happens, monitoring becomes much harder because people have 
very little or only dangerous possibilities to report their experiences. So the real challenge, in my view, we are facing today is bringing together all the information we have. Because there's so many of us collecting this. And as we all know, if we have networks, they're essentially social networks and they're built out of communities. And in each community, there are voices that are heard and there are people who are not part of that um, community. So what we are faced with today, the big challenge is how can we bring all of this information together and how can we make sure that all the different voices are heard and that we really understand whose voices are loud and clear and whose voices are we still missing? So I would say today we have quite a rich tapestry of information and that helps organizations like MSF to get increasingly better at the prevention and mitigation. We've heard about the safe house and many other measures are taken as standard procedures now to protect health workers. But there is one big piece in all our information gathering that still has a very long way to go. And this is the issue of accountability that Len also mentioned. The level of evidence required in court is such that it is or it remains still very, very difficult to prove the intention, the impact and the scale of these attacks in a way that a court could address them. Despite the fact that most of these cases we are seeing are probably violation of IHL. And this is the other really big challenge we need to think about. And with that, I'll pass back to you, Dr. Bordeaux. Thank you. Okay, well, that, that is uh, certainly given me a lot to think about. And I and we're gonna come back to that issue of you know data and how and accountability and uh, prosecution. Uh, you know, what, what do you need to prosecute or, or to, uh, to think about, um, uh, you know, standards of evidence um, in a little bit. I would um, like to turn it now over to Dr. Keita uh, for, you know, to kind of fill in a little bit uh, more here. I think the, um, Dr. Keita, uh, you are uh, involved on the ground in many, many different uh, types of uh, setting, uh, settings affected by armed conflict. Um, you know, we would love to hear from you, uh, you know, what this looks like on the ground, what are differences uh, between uh, con areas of conflict or conflict zones when it comes to health delivery and, um, and uh, you know, and, and protection of, of health workers. Um, so turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Hi, Kate. So um, it really gave me, you know, uh, goosebumps, you know, just listening and, and Christian at this moment. So, and it's an honor for me uh, to be here today to talk about my short experience in Tigray, uh, which for me is one of the richest, but also one of the saddest, you know, experience uh, in my humanitarian career. And so I would like just to give a brief background of uh, my experience uh, in Tigray. So as you may know, um, uh, Tigray is one of the 10 regional states of Ethiopia and since November 2020 uh, has been facing, you know, a devastating uh, armed conflict. So, and after the conflict, uh, many areas in Tigray were occupied by the you know, you know, federal army and allies, uh, Eritrean forces. And, uh, <clears throat> And so the heavy fighting, you know, between the the uh, the allied and the, the the forces fighting on behalf of the Tigray regional government and people are called uh, yeah, you know, TDF. So has left thousand deaf, displaced uh, more than two million people, you know, from their homes. And in April, in April, they are 2021. So I was deployed to Ethiopia. Uh, in Chile to support the IRC emergency response in help in nutrition as health specialist. And uh, Chile is a town located in northwestern zone of Tigray. And this area was occupied 
by Eritrean forces for many years, uh, many months, sorry. And it's also one of the area shelled several times by Allied forces, and uh, which led to a significant number of deaths of civilians. And in terms of uh, IDPs in, um, in that area, it was much over uh, 350,000 uh, people in Shiri town. Uh, in modern and you know in surrounded area, and settled into sites and also in host families. So our response as IRC uh, it targeted many locations, including Shire Town and uh, other surrounding towns such as Shiraru, which is nearest to Eritrea, and uh, some area in Amhara territory called Mysore. And so, what were the impacts of the attacks on healthcare, uh, what I have seen in, you know, during my, uh, my presence in Tigray. So first, talking about uh, the functionality of the health structure after the war, according to the data from the Tigray, uh, the Tigray Regional Health Bureau, um, on the functionality of the health structure, 80% uh, of the health center and 70% of the hospital were partially or completely non-functional, leaving only 15% of health center and 30% of hospital to provide services to the community member. Mm -hmm. And so also many have reported that the deliberate destruction, the destruction, vandalization and looting of the entire health system has been one of the health mark of the conflict. And many civilian structures, including hospital in some places were shelved looted and destroyed by militaries. And uh, regarding the availability of the health services, uh, so I would like just to give an example. So after the war, most of the maternal and child health services were collapsed, including the basic services, such as ANC, antenatal care, postnatal care, and immunization services. Uh, so in terms of response capacity, even so, you know, the local governments uh, through the Minister of Health uh, with, with its partner has attempt to deliver limited medicines and vaccines. The deliveries we know was blocked or looted in many places by the Allied forces. And uh, so the access was really limited. The access to some area was really limited, especially to those area occupied by Allied forces. And uh, sometimes humanitarian responders were blocked, harassed, um, and all, you know, sometimes threatened when it comes to cross some area just to assist community members. And also added to the power and communication blackout, no telephone, network, no need, uh, internet neither. All the banks were closed, no cash, you know, you know and all the markets were running a shortage of the basic goods, including fuel, uh, which is really important for you know, vehicle. And uh, all this situation makes the response effort difficult. So as IRC, we are running uh, some mobile, uh, mobile health teams to provide the basic health and nutrition services uh, to more than 30 health centers, health posts, and uh, at community level. So, um, um, so it was really difficult just to see, and we were obliged to, uh, to readapt our approach, our strategy every time because the context is really dynamic and volatile. And uh, just to, um, so this is what I can share quickly with you. I would like, so I would be happy to respond in question relative based on my experience and knowledge. Over to you, Dr. Margaret. Dr. Keda, I mean, uh, you know, that is, I think you're really putting your finger on what I think is so compelling and difficult uh, to sort of conceptualize. And I'd like to kind of uh, start our, our discussion a little bit with this point of, you know, what we think about when we think about an attack on healthcare. Um, you know, I think in the sort of public imagination and also in, um, you know, in some ways the Geneva Conventions really thinks about an attack on healthcare as, 
destruction of infrastructure or a targeting of a health worker um, or an attack on a, on a injured or uh, ill person. Um, when what you are describing is much vaster uh, you know, in terms of um, what does a health system need to function? You know, if you can maybe not blow up a health center, but if you deprive it of fuel and electricity and supplies, <laughs> you know, that's going to perhaps have, you know, very similar outcomes for the population. Um, and, you know, even, uh, you know, sort of the research, uh, which I think is so uh, compelling around, you know, much more invisible attacks on health systems that maybe have longer term impacts like the raiding of health funds, uh, the destruction of the health workforce, not necessarily the health worker, but the inability to, uh, for the public sector to continue to pay uh, or the, even the regulated private sector, uh, the ability to pay and keep on staff health workers. So there's actually a health workforce. Um, you know, these are, these are types of uh, disruptions and elements of destruction ultimately of health systems that I, I think is so, uh, so difficult to point out to the, the, the public and yet can have sort of generational uh, impacts. Um, so I, I take the liberty to ask all of you a few, a few questions before I turn it over to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, the public chat, which I see a lot, a number of really wonderful questions I definitely want to get to. But just to hover for a moment on this issue of what constitutes an attack on healthcare. Um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Rubenstein, you know, maybe you can help us understand a little bit like how, how much protection does the Geneva Conventions and the international humanitarian law actually offer? You know, what really constitutes an attack on healthcare um, in international humanitarian law? And, you know, is that, is it sufficient? <laughs> Leading question there. <laughs> Pretty much everything is prohibited that interferes or obstructs healthcare. As the Geneva Convention evolved over years, uh, they expanded from concern with direct attacks to use of indiscriminate attacks, for example, what the Saudis did, where they did not target health facilities much, but they didn't properly target military installations and hit hospitals. Uh, I mentioned checkpoints. Obstruction or delays at checkpoint probably are responsible for more deaths than spectacular bombings of hospitals. Those are prohibited. Obstruction of access is, is, is prohibited. Looting of supplies, blocking of supplies is prohibited. Uh, so the law is very strong uh, and it's very difficult to think of actions that, as you say, impair the availability of healthcare either through threats or violence or uh, uh, related activities. And threats are really important. For example, in, in Afghanistan, the Taliban wanted to control health services when they were, before they came in power, and they would force closure of a health facility. There was no, no, unless they got what they wanted. And that, there was no evidence of violence, but it impacted that facility and often facilities in the whole region because the threat would apply to them as well. But the conventions are very strong. We're very fortunate to have law that applies to all of these kinds of activities. Uh, and, and, and the word attack is unfortunately, uh, it's so evocative that we tend to, to limit what we think the Geneva Conventions um, require. Uh, but they're far broader than that. And human rights law as well, uh, re remember, guarantees uh, access to health care. And it's not just a matter of violent acts, but anything that prevents them uh, from getting health care. And Tigray is a perfect example where the government is preventing people in, from uh, Tigray uh, from gaining access to health care in various ways. And that's a violation of the right to health as well as the Geneva Conventions. 
So the law is broad and should be, you know, speaking to all of these uh, different types of uh, interference with, uh, if not outright attack on, uh, on healthcare. Um, you know, then why the heck isn't it working? Uh, <laughs> Director Vila, you know, what is the standard of evidence that needs to be collected or brought in order to, you know, actually have some uh, prosecutorial ability or accountability at least? Oh, this is a really, really difficult question. And I'm not sure I can answered that not because of the fact that I'm not a full lawyer but also in particular because of a meeting I was in yesterday where we were discussing just that and we came out of that meeting less clear than we went into it and the issues around it are just so complex so where to start the first issue we need the actual evidence but whoever films the actual attack that is incredibly rare. We have seen a few things from Ukraine where they were filmed, but they were probably filmed by Ukrainian military. So there are many questions of the admissibility of these within a court of law. There are civilians who've been using apps that may be admissible, but they've not filmed the attack. Then there is the question of how can you actually link what you see as the aftermath that people tend to record to any particular person. Because if we want to take it to a court of law, we need to identify the responsible party. And how can we identify whoever caused the damage? And the particular challenge here is also the use of explosive weapons in many instances, because they can be fired from a tank, in which case they may be in front of the hospital. So the commander would be right there they can be fired from something as 70 kilometers away. Who do we know who actually ordered this? Um, there's also the question, and if there's aerial bombardments, it comes from an, a center that authorizes this probably somewhere at headquarters. In Ukraine, they've been shot from the sea. In um, Tigray, they've been delivered by armed drones. So how can we get to who is responsible, who's doing the commands here? That is incredibly difficult. And then there is the really complex question of what is it actually that is the violation we're looking at? Is it the type of weapons used? Are we looking at what's referred to as wide area effects weapon, where it is the lack of precaution being taken because as we've seen in Ukraine, increasingly weapons are being used that are built in the 1960s with the intention to target a plane or um, a boat. And they just go for the tallest object, which can be a hospital. So it, in that case, it would be case building around you've chosen the wrong weapon for what you're doing. But then there may also be cases where precision weapons that had coordinates put into their modern technology go directly for a hospital. And here we have to think about a very different case building. So it is incredibly complex. And then there's also the issue of, and this is what some people in this meeting yesterday said, they think there need to be civilian casualties at the same time to make a court interested in this, that perhaps just the damage to the infrastructure would not give it high enough priority, given that they are competing with so many other events of civilians being killed or mutilated. Or um, So we're currently looking into seeing how many events can we find where this is both civilian um, harm and the actual damage, because this whole link that I think also Chape um, pointed out so well, the consequences of the destruction and what this does to people is so difficult to document and that's the huge challenge to bring that into a court to actually understand the significant uh, significance of the damage and then to find the responsible for it because it also goes so wide in terms of the other elements that contribute to it so yes unfortunately very complicated <laughs> um it does sound incredibly complicated. And uh, you can also see why in such a daunting sort of uh, task uh, in the middle of, um, you know, such, such destruction, 
Uh, and I, you know, I think that you also kind of this, this question of intent is something that I think is, um, chimes a lot with some of the questions in the chat around the nature of the armed conflict. Um, and, you know, kind of turning over to you, Dr. Keita, uh, Keita I think the, you know, this issue, should we take into consideration uh, you know, when you are designing interventions uh, or you're trying to help people uh, in uh, conflict settings, you're trying to deliver care, you know, should it matter to you, does it matter to you why there is an armed conflict? In other words, you know, is uh, your calculation of risk, uh, are the strategies that you use to try to protect um, health workers and patients different, depending on if you are, you know, in a place where there is a, you know, uh, civil conflict versus a, um, you know, chronic uh, sort of heavily criminalized, let's say, armed uh, conflict simmering over many years, as maybe in Eastern uh, DRC, you might imagine or you know, an interstate conflict uh, between you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Does it matter on the ground why people are fighting uh, from the perspective of delivering care and uh, protecting uh, your workers? Um, Dr. Dr. Kader, can you hear? I was directing that one at you. <laughs> oh, I, you're still on mute, I think. Uh, oh, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, I think you might have just cut out. Um, well, I, uh, I'm gonna reshape that question until Dr. Kata can re rejoin us um, to, uh, to Professor Rubenstein. Um, are there differences uh, in how you think about uh, either administering international humanitarian law or um, uh, documenting uh, uh, attacks on health uh, healthcare uh, based on the type of conflict or the typology of conflict or the reason for conflict. I mean, it's an ethnic conflict versus a, like I said, an interstate conflict, a conflict for land, a conflict for governmental control. What it, does, does that difference matter? Oh, Dr. Kata, did you just rejoin us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, uh, oh, I can hear you now. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Back, one, hold, hold that thought, Professor Rubens. Okay. Yeah, sorry, my internet bandwidth is it's, it's weak. So can you just repeat your question, please? Sure, I was just going to say, does the type of conflict, the reason for the conflict uh, matter uh, when it comes to thinking about health delivery and strategies for protecting your workers or, or addressing the needs of patients? Does it matter if it's an interstate conflict versus a civil conflict, uh, you know, intrastate conflict? a, um, you know, ethnic conflict, uh, does it matter to you? Okay, so um, let's talk about, for example, um, nature and from today. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, one, of, one of the things, uh, for example, when I came there, because the strategy was already designed and uh, proposal writing and everything in place. And uh, I was just here to support the implementation and, uh, and make sure our strategy was really adapted to the context. Um, so when I when it comes to okay to uh, to talk about uh, so what I observed is for example, in integrate you know um, uh, the military forces you know uh, they don't really respect the international humanitarian law. So, uh, sometimes we are feeling like they don't have any. You know, idea about that because um, you know um, they are supposed to. You know, they have a role to play to protect the delivery of the healthcare. You know, uh, in in such a you know, context, but uh, that was not really the the, um, the case. And 
for me, the, the first thing is to uh, everything we have to put in the place. So we have to uh, involve the... No, no. <laughs> well, that is one of the occupational um, hazards of, of his work uh, with the internet uh, being very... Uh, very haphazard. Um, I will kick it back to you, uh, Professor Rubenstein, to, to help us think a little bit more about the differences uh, between uh, conflicts and the particularly internal interstate conflict versus interstate conflict. I think there are differences uh, in certain respects, uh, but some of them don't depend on the type of conflict. Um, mm -hmm. In civil wars, uh, in Africa, uh, where most of the um, weaponry does not include uh, modern air power, uh, you are much more likely to have looting, um, uh, stealing of supplies, uh, invasion of clinics, burning clinics. It's because people use the weapons they have. At the same time, in those kinds of conflicts, the, uh, the government, particularly the Ministry of Health, has the potential to engage in activities uh, ranging from negotiation directly with combatants, including mm -hmm. the government's military forces and supporting health workers. So uh, both the kind, in those kinds of wars, the kinds of attacks are somewhat different, but there's an opportunity for real leadership uh, by the Ministry of Health and uh, in the Central African Republic for example, the minister has been extraordinarily uh, aggressive in addressing this, in, mm -hmm. uh, in supporting health workers and in uh, taking combatants uh, and, and negotiating and taking calling out combatants. Uh, in wars involving uh, major air power, even though it's a civil war, like, like uh, in Syria, where the, the, the government is the major perpetrator, and it, you have to use totally different strategies. Hmm. And, and uh, so, so it's hard to say that the difference between interstate wars and, and civil wars are the real key difference. Uh, it mostly uh, has to do with, with the weapons and the capacities. Uh, hmm. Another example is in Gaza, uh, where uh, you could say that's an internal war uh, of some kind, uh, and and there's a huge difference in weaponry, uh, and the the means it, it puts the burden uh, heavily also on uh, the country in this case Israel with the with the means to prevent these attacks on hospitals to do mm -hmm. so. Uh, the justice of the war. Uh, really doesn't come into play. Uh, people have argued, what about Hamas? What about Hamas is indiscriminately bombing, uh, sending rockets into Israel, which is also a war crime, no doubt about it. But the fact that they are doing that does not excuse Israel from taking the kind of precautions required to prevent harm to healthcare in its military operations. It's a rather complicated answer. Uh, but it does show that there are ways of preventing attacks in all these circumstances. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that this issue around, I'm, I'm trying to pick up a little bit on some of the questions in the chat, you know, with that, with that uh, particular question. I think um, the others that I want to sort of hover over, there's been a number of questions really related to this notion of, you know, is you know, is anybody, is any international agency or part, you know, truly neutral? Um, and, you know, this really echoes a lot of uh, conversation, debate, often very heated debate uh, between, uh, that I've, you know, heard and, and, and participated in between, you know, militaries and uh, humanitarian uh, workers and organizations, where, you know, from, uh, you know, maybe our person, the humanitarian perspective, you know, it's very clear cut, 
and the Geneva Conventions are the Geneva Conventions. But as you're saying, uh, Professor Rubenstein, uh, you know, there's a different perspective when you're embroiled in the middle of an armed conflict where there's concerns, for example, that, you know, a, uh, that MSF, uh, you know, is having, a, has a hospital that is routinely used uh, to uh, provide care to one party of the conflict that is enabling them to, uh, that party to the conflict is perceived to have battlefield advantage because of that uh, healthcare uh, there's, they're, um, they're receiving. Um, and, you know, militaries will tell you, you know, they believe they invented public health, right? Because they recognize the importance of uh, health care for soldiers in order to uh, be able to, uh, you know, prosecute a war. Um, so, you know, when you're up and up close to it, you see that, you know, this issue of like, wow, you know, is it really neutral? Are you really impartial and, you know, to a conflict when you are, you know, providing needed critical service, health services to one uh, side or perceived to, to be pro providing it to one side? Um, and, you know, this kind of echoes a little bit with one of the questions in the chat, which has come up repeatedly about, you know, uh, well, uh, the WHO is headed by Dr. Tedros, who is Tigrayan, who is the architect of the Ethiopian, um, you know, health uh, system. Uh, and, uh, you know, is, is the WHO, can, can Ethiopia count on the WHO being sort of a neutral party uh, to that, uh, you, you know, being able to evaluate what's happening in Tigray in an unbiased way. Um, so this issue around, you know, is, you know, the Geneva Conventions are pretty cut and dried, but, you know, what do we, what do we say in, in practice, right, to, to uh, you know, to those voices that have, you know, real concerns about this notion that healthcare can actually be um, delivered in a neutral way when all of the entire society is not, uh, you know, is, is uh, polarized and around uh, the two poles of a conflict. Um, I'm happy to address that, but the other panelists may want to do yeah. that. One of the greatest misunderstandings about the Geneva Conventions is a concept of neutrality for medical services. There is no requirement for neutrality. In fact, the word neutrality was taken out for this reason a uh, hundred years ago, because healthcare workers can't be neutral. An Assyrian uh, trying to, uh, doctor trying to help uh, provide healthcare is not neutral in the sense that that doctor has an allegiance. So we can't, neutrality is not required. What is required is impartiality. And that goes back to the original Geneva Convention that impartiality means you must treat everyone without distinction, no matter who it is. And it's very rare actually for hospitals to refuse to uh, treat people of a, uh, of a different side. In fact, NGOs, and I'm sure, uh, 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 even military uh, entities are required to and do treat everyone, even an enemy soldier. And MSF is really very well known as is ICRC and other NGOs for very strongly letting the world know that they will treat everyone because they are impartial. So there is no real contradiction between the Geneva Conventions and the real world. Uh, the problem is when combatant forces don't respect that impartiality and they punish health providers for being impartial. And that by that, not for being impartial, in other words, they don't want their enemies to be treated and they take it out on health providers. But the law is very clear on this. Uh, and once again, the problem is in commitments and especially setting out rules for soldiers, whether an armed group or a conventional military force, setting out those rules and enforcing them and training people in them. So uh, I don't think that the, I think we should stick or stay away from this question of neutrality because it really is not part of the law 
at least in this sense, there's neutrality for other parties in the conventions. For example, <laughs> countries can be neutral. Uh, and there are humanitarian principles that, that, uh, that NGOs adhere to voluntarily. But uh, for the law, and especially for local health workers who are, who are the most common victims uh, of the violence, uh, uh, there is no requirement of neutrality. Inciting neutrality all the time puts them at greater danger. Um, so that, you know, that, that's quite interesting, right? This, uh, this notion of neutrality being, um, something that might be over, over invoked and uh, to, uh, and may actually increase, uh, targeting of, of healthcare workers and humanitarian workers. I think, you know, sort of sticking with that theme, you know, how does that translate that issue of, um, evaluating fairly, let's just say fairness. Um, uh, Director Villa, you know, this issue of you, you're trying to sort through massive amounts potentially of information um, and, you know, but you're doing it at a time when of course misinformation and disinformation and propaganda, which has always been around, but now has, you know, a is it can be on steroids because of uh, because of the internet. And um, I'm wondering, you know, I, I, there's been a some conversations that I've heard and some, you know, papers written about, you know, wow, the need for re sort of reconsidering how do the Geneva Conventions apply in times of, you know, information warfare or in uh, the sort of context of um, you know, of, of, of a, well, a connected world uh, through the internet uh, where, you know, healthcare um, facilities are the number one target worldwide for cyber attacks, for example. Um, you know, and we're, you know, really sort of dealing with uh, old problems of very, very new ways when it comes to evaluating um, uh, and being fair and understanding uh, information and, and, uh, and intelligence um, you know, in these contexts, do you think that there is a need for a rethinking of the Geneva Conventions or a new sort of Geneva Convention that would that would uh, that would uh, speak to you know information war or uh, cyber war uh, in the context of attacks on 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 health on health uh, on healthcare and health systems? Thank you. No, this is a really, really important issue. And I think one that also needs more discussion. And I would add to that, it's not only the cyber attacks on the health systems as such. Mm -hmm. It is also the cyber attacks on humanitarian agencies and mm -hmm. even an organization like Minds that sits in neutral Switzerland and where we felt very secure being able to say things that our humanitarian partners feel they cannot do because it would challenge their impartiality, neutrality. We always felt we can say that no one can touch us. We are far from the field. In that sense, we are only have an online present. And that is no longer the case. And I think that raises a lot of really important questions of how we understand um, neutrality. Also for a country like Switzerland that considers itself neutral, but where its own organizations can be attacked on its own territory and what can the state do to protect that. Um, but also for, for the individuals working in all of these agencies. And um, yes, cyber attacks have been a very big issue for anyone working in Ukraine. And um, it's, I think it does require thinking about it in a new way because we are truly living in a borderless um, society and conflicts can, through the internet, be easily brought across borders and we need to find new ways of addressing that. Uh, fantastic. I just thank you all for your for your um, in incredible insights and I, I'm sorry we're leaving it a little bit on a note of there's more questions and more to discuss, um, but uh, I think we could go on for, for several hours. I do want to uh, turn it back over to nurse Lindsay Martin uh, for some concluding remarks. Thank you all. 
Thank you, Margaret. Uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, to our speakers today, Africa, Margaret, Christina, Sheikh, and Len, for sharing your experiences and your expertise. And we've really only begun to discuss these complex issues, but just to re readdress the imperative, you know, an unprecedented number of international health care workers have deployed into, con into conflict settings since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, um, myself included, and with varying degrees really of understanding of the potential consequences of healthcare targeted violence. And I think this webinar is an opportunity and, and others like it to think more about personal accountability uh, and also to remember and highlight that local staff and patients remain on the, on the front lines when humanitarian workers return home. So I wanna thank um, you all for your continued efforts in the sphere and to protect the, the right to healthcare during times of conflict around the globe. Thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, as a reminder to all the recording for this webinar will be available to the, on the Harvard Global Health Institute's website in the coming days. And I would just say,